Good evening, uh, peoples, and welcome again to my uh, living room with me and Ginger Snap. Say hi. Okay. Uh, so for tonight's Bible study, uh, since it is June, which is Pride Month, I thought that we would look at one of the uh, clobber passages that has been used um, against people. There are a few of them in the Bible. Um, I'm just going to get through two of them this month. Um, they are passages that can be a bit difficult to read and definitely have some uh, linguistic difficulties to them, but they are uh, important to read and discuss and be aware of. So tonight's passage is a single verse uh, from the book of Leviticus, which I know is everybody's favorite book of the Bible, right? That was a joke. I'm hoping that you laughed at home. Uh, so uh, Leviticus 18.22 in the NRSV, which is the Bible we usually read, uh, reads, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Uh, so it's fun verse. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. So there's a few layers to this, this verse that we're going to go through really quick. Um, so lie with a male as with a woman. So um, fun fact, the word uh, homosexuality and the concept of um, sexual identity uh, didn't and sexual preference didn't exist until the year 1868. So prior to the year 1868, that's 80 of course, um, there wasn't any idea of uh, two people of the same gender being in a relationship. Um, there might have been uh, same sex uh, partnerships, relationships, whatever, um, but it wasn't understood in uh, anywhere near the same way that it is now after 1868. So at the time that Leviticus was written, um, two consenting men did not, not a thing. Um, there wouldn't have been any kind of uh, partnership formalized um, or recognized um, like we might have now. So it's okay, internet. So uh, the word male um, in this verse, in other places in the Bible, it is not translated um, male as in adult man, but as in male child. Um, so uh, in the German Bible, for example, um, you would definitely be reading boy as opposed to man. So, um, which is an interesting thing uh, in the the German Bible that it takes that nuance of the Hebrew, whereas uh, the English doesn't necessarily. This word in other places is translated as boy, but not necessarily in this verse in English Bible specifically, which is very interesting. Um, so in the ancient world, there was this thing called pederasty which um, I'm very opposed to. So pederasty is the practice of a boy being a kind of apprenticed to an older man in a sexual sense, um, and that has issues. There's a power dynamic that is very unbalanced, and there's a an age issue and a consent issue, and that's that's problematic. But uh, I mention this because for the people of the time that Leviticus was written, this would be the only kind of same-sex relationship that people would be familiar with. And if that's all that you see in the world, um, then it's a fairly reasonable thing to take issue with. Um, so there are some translation layers there. But I think more interesting, uh, linguistically, is the word that's translated as abomination. Uh, so sometimes it's translated as detestable or abhorrence, which are all just great, very colorful words. Uh, some people really like to translate this word as makes God want to throw up, which I uh, disagree with that translation, but I definitely appreciate um, how uh, descriptive it is. It's a very colorful phrase, makes God want to throw up. So this word in Hebrew, uh, toeva, is used 117 times about in uh, Hebrew in the Hebrew Bible. So what it means is something like uh, ritually unclean, um, unable to enter the temple, uh, or might refer to uh, dirty clothes. So um, 
things that are also described as toeva uh, would include having sex with women on her period, um, falsifying weights to uh, like to cheat people if you're selling them grain, um, to like mess with the scale so that it looks like you're selling them more than you are. Um, those are given the same level of don't do that as uh, to lie with the male as with a woman. Um, so toeva is kind of a um, like a, a cultural no-no, uh, things that are discouraged, um, maybe kind of like jaywalking, as opposed to there is another word which is much stronger, uh, zima, which means evil or deserving punishment from God. Uh, this verse, you shall not lie with a woman, with a male as with a woman, does not use the word zima. It does not uh, say that that is evil and deserving punishment from God. Uh, it just means that someone is ritually unclean, unable to enter the, the uh, temple. So some things that are described as zima, which is only used 29 times in the Hebrew Bible, uh, that would include things like idolatry or child sacrifice, definitely don't do those, uh, being cruel to the vulnerable, really don't do that, uh, and of course, murder. Murder is zima. Uh, murder is definitely evil and deserving punishment from God. Uh, so those are two very different qualifications of please don't do this. So one is maybe like jaywalking, and then on the other side you get murder. And I think that if you're going to translate something from Hebrew into makes God want to throw up, I think it would be more fair to place that on something like uh, murder or uh, systemic evils or oppression or being cruel to the vulnerable, as in Ezekiel 22. Um, so, you know, there are different uh, cultural expectations rules in a society, but they aren't necessarily all equal. So like jaywalking versus murder, I mean, don't do either of them, I guess. But one is much lesser and is kind of based on its context. So this is not necessarily the most uh, straightforward verse. Um, it definitely could have used different Hebrew words that would be much stronger or more clear. Uh, and of course, um, in terms of culture and language and history, we are very far distant from this text. It was written thousands of years ago in a culture that was very different from ours, that understood uh, human biology different, and that understood how the world fundamentally works very differently than we do, um, and had some pretty different um, worries and concerns. So uh, in the ancient world, temple prostitutes were a thing. Not really a thing now, um, but if you're associating pederasty with temple prostitution, then yeah, if you're going to be among the Israelite people and the people of God and following God's laws, you know, don't do that because that is against the laws of God and that is not worshiping our God. That is not how we worship God. Um, but that's not a concern that we have today. So, I mean, still don't do it, but it's not as relevant of a cultural command. So translations really do make a very big difference in how we read uh, verses of the Bible or the Bible overall. So like in the German translation, uh, it's, it's very clear that it is male child rather than male more generally. And it's really interesting that that's so clear in the German translation, but tends to be a bit more fuzzy in a, a, across the board in English translations. And that really affects how people read it because most people didn't spend several semesters studying Hebrew like I suffered through and didn't spend several semesters on Greek and wouldn't think to look at other languages of the Bible. Most people read the Bible in the language that they speak, which I mean, fair. Honestly, fair. I usually just read the Bible in English. Um, but I think that when all else fails and we do come across sections of the Bible that are uh, harder to translate than others, harder to understand than others, um, harder to read, when all else fails, I think it's really important to read just the next chapter from this verse in Leviticus 18, where in Leviticus 19, we find the verse love your neighbor. And love your neighbor is a very clear verse. 
And so I think that if we have trouble reading anything in the Bible, love your neighbor is what we should turn to. And if your reading of a verse does not encourage you to love your neighbor or to do right in the eyes of God, then um, maybe you're not reading it in all of the ways that you could be. Um, but love your neighbor is a great verse to come back to in all of the ways that we treat the people that we know and interact with. Um, so there have been times throughout all of the thousands of years of the history of the Bible when various sections have been used against people or used to hurt people. Um, this has certainly come up in my life. It's, it's not something new. Um, and while there are definitely sins that the Bible condemns, there's also this bit about, you know, take the, the log out of your eye before you deal with the little bit in someone else's. Um, the Bible should remind us to live better lives and should remind us to do justice and mercy and humility um, and to love our neighbor. Uh, so this is one of the clobber passages that has been used against the LGBTQIA community. Uh, it tends to be pulled out of context. Um, single verses do fit better on picket signs than, um, I don't know, uh, let's see, 11-minute commentary on single verses, uh, for, for example, or um, linguistic nuance. Uh, it is pretty easy to pull things out of context, but it's uh, a little important to read what things are written in. Uh, even the book of Leviticus itself has way more to say against incest than it does against men having sex with men or men having sex with boys, depending on your reading of that verse. Um, so, you know, context, honestly. But when all fails, love your neighbor. Um, so we'll be back uh, next week with another of these clobber passages because I really wanted to challenge myself this month. Apparently they are um, a bit hard to read because they have so much um, against them and weight behind them and baggage. Definitely verses with baggage. Uh, so can I wake you up real quick so you can say goodnight? So <laughs> good night, peoples. Uh, we hope to see you tomorrow night for Wednesday evening prayer uh, and um, enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>